Amen, amen. So good to be with you here today. Harvest. Are you excited for church today? It's a long weekend. You get an extra day of sleep tomorrow, so you might as well be awake today. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis 1. We have the great privilege of continuing in our series called Redemption, God's Great Plan. And today, we have one job. It's to go through the entire Bible. You up for the task? I'm not joking. We're going Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation. And there's a few reasons we do that, but before we get started, let's pray. The Lord knows we need it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are in desperate need of your presence. Oh Lord, would your spirit fill this place. Oh God, would you empty us of ourselves and would you fill us again with your spirit. Oh Lord, we need you. Oh God, there is nothing besides you that is worth worshiping. And so Lord, would you receive all the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise in everything we do. Lord, we thank you for the redemptive plan that you've put before us. Oh God, we thank you that you have called us your children. Lord, we need you desperately. We ask for your spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. So we are going through the entire Bible today. I was reading online this week that it takes about 70 hours and 40 minutes to read the entire Bible out loud. So if we get started in Genesis 1, we'll finish up next Sunday morning. You guys don't have plans for the long weekend, do you? I'm just joking. We're going to get through this, and we're going to have to get through it quick. We don't have much time, but let's just go over why. Why are we doing this? Well, so often when we preach, most of the time when we preach, we kind of look at one passage of Scripture, and we dig deep into that passage, and we see how it applies to our lives. We see the truth about God in that passage, and, and that's what we do. But every now and then, it's good just to take a step back and look at the overarching narrative of the entire Scripture God wrote a book, and in this book, there's lots of stories. You think of David and Solomon and Noah and Moses and Paul and Esther and Ruth, amazing stories of God's grace, but there's an overarching narrative. There's an overarching theme, that theme being redemption, God's redemptive plan. And so today, we are going to see God's great story I think it's important for us to know this and to know how the Bible works together for a few reasons. One of those reasons is that it will change the way we do missions. You see, right now we are in the middle of God's plan, and how can we know what to do if we don't know where we've been? I think it's also important because how can we fully appreciate the work of Jesus Christ on the cross if we don't know what it took for him to get there? So again, turn in your Bibles, Genesis 1-1, and we're going to be walking through all of Scripture, all right? When I was in school, they taught us how to write a good story. Do you remember this? And I know class is just out, but we're going to just step back into class for a minute, okay? I remember that they used to teach us five key elements to any good story, and I'm sure any novel you've read that's any good or any movie you've watched in some way has these elements. The first element, they call it uh, exposition. And an exposition in a story is the setting of the scene. It's kind of giving us the place that the story takes place. And it's introducing to us the characters of the story. After the exposition, you have the rising action of the story. This is starting to ring some bells, right, of like grade three and four. Starting, and, and we have the rising action of the story where the major conflict takes place, and then the results of that conflict and the working out of that conflict, and the anticipation grows, and then eventually you get to the climax of your story. And in the climax, that's where the hero of the story, he conquers, he wins the big battle, he has a great epiphany, and and then we have the falling action. And the falling action is a result of the climax, and it's leading us as things unravel to the conclusion. And the conclusion is the fifth and key element of the story, where the hero returns home in his new normal, and he's learned some kind of lesson. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's how we're going to break up the Bible today. So again, Genesis 1, and let's get started. The exposition, and here's the point, is that Jesus is the creator. Jesus, the creator. See, this whole story, this is the one key theme, all right? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Cover to cover, cover to cover, the Bible is all about Jesus. So exposition, let's see what's going on here. Jesus, the creator. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Right in the first verse of the Bible, we're introduced to two major things, where this story takes place, and God, the major character in this story. 
We see in the next six days, God creates the stars in the sky. He creates the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, the animals on the ground and the trees and the grass and all of the plants. And then on the sixth day, he does something really, really cool. He creates man and woman. And he does it a little bit different. He says that he made them in his own image. You know what that means? You know what that means? It doesn't mean that they're exactly like him, but it means just as my son looks a lot like me, he is made in my image. Not like a dog that is not at all in my image. We are made in the image of God. And he does that on the sixth day. So this is the exposition of the story. This is the scene is set. God has created the heavens and the earth. He's created everything and he's created man and women. And in our story, in this place, we have harmony. We have peace. And in John chapter 1, verse 3, we learn that it was Jesus who did all of the creating. It says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is setting the scene. This story is all about Jesus. And we have peace. We have harmony. We have perfect harmony. There's no sin. Just imagine being in this place. God takes man and woman, and he places them in the Garden of Eden. Just imagine being there. No sin, um, nothing hindering you in your prayers to God, nothing getting in the way of righteous living, no temptation. Well, there is some we find out in a bit. But your relationship with God is pure. There's no shame. You're living perfectly before your perfect creator, your perfect God. Take the best day of your life, multiply it by infinity, and we're almost close to what it would have been like in the garden. Beautiful, amazing, amazing days. And sometimes we wish that the Bible would just kind of end at the end of chapter 2, don't we? But the story continues, and there's another 1,187 chapters to get through. So we got a lot to do today. It's not the end of the story, but we see that Jesus is the creator and the scene is set. We move from there and we move into our second point, the rising action. And here, through this whole rising action of the story, we see that Jesus is the promise. And this really takes up the bulk of our story. I mean, if you you have your Bibles with you, if you go from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of the Old Testament, you just before Matthew, you see Malachi there. And that is, there you go. That is the rising action of the story. Anticipation builds through the whole thing. God does so much. It's the meat of the story and the majority of it. There needs to be suspense in any good story, and God is the master storyteller. So let's go through the majority of the Old Testament here. Right at the beginning, Genesis, uh, Genesis 3. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 3. We see that there's this new character introduced. He, he is a serpent And we learn in Revelations 9, or sorry, Revelations 12, verse 9, that this serpent is Satan. This serpent is the devil. And this serpent goes to the woman and he deceives her. Because God had told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he deceives her and says that it would be good, it would make her wise, it would make her like God, and she desires this. And she eats the fruit and she gives it to her husband, who is with her, and he eats as well. And in this moment, the relationship, that perfect harmony, that peace is broken between man and God. There's nothing they can do to restore this relationship. There's nothing they can do to fix it. And they're lost, and they feel shame. You see that they feel shame because um, right after this happens, they run away. But it's amazing when they sin and God finds them, In their shame, he makes an awesome promise. He makes an awesome promise. Look at this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. He starts laying out um, punishment to everybody. He says to the serpent, he says, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then in uh, verse 15, something really remarkable happens. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What is he saying there? What is he saying? He's saying that there's going to be a problem, a conflict between you and the woman and her offspring. But one day from the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman will come someone who is going to crush the head of the enemy. The promise has been made. 
One day things will be made right. One day someone will come that will crush the head of the enemy. God makes this promise before he even lays out the punishment to man and woman. You see, the man and the woman are filled with shame. Remember, they ran off and they hid themselves from God. And they didn't want to look him in the face because of their sin. We've all encountered this sin in our lives. Every, I guarantee this, every single person in this room has sinned and felt shame because of their sin. I know this is true because in my own life it's happened, but I also know this is true because I have a two and a half year old. And my two and a half year old, Levi, just this week, he was, uh, I was opening up the fridge and he goes up and grabs the shelf, you know, on the fridge door. And I was like, Levi, don't grab that shelf. Don't grab that shelf. And as soon as I turn around and grab the thing of milk, he's broken the shelf and he cracked it. And you can see on his face right away, you know, like, oh, oh no. He goes up to his room. Daddy comes up to talk to him and he's upset. He's crying. And I sit him on my lap and it's like, okay, Levi, what happened? And he wants to get this problem dealt with right away, right? So he goes, Lili broke glass. He can't pronounce his own name. He says, Lili. Lili broke glass. Lili, listen, daddy. He just wants to then move on to playing. I'm like, Levi, look at daddy. Look me in the eyes. And he's like, <laughs> you know, avoiding my eye contact at all costs because he's felt, he feels shame. He knows what he did was wrong. He knows that his father told him to do something and he did the opposite. And there was consequences for that. He feels that shame and so did Adam and Eve and so do we to this day. God sets out his promise that one day the serpent's head will be crushed. And this is the launching point of our redemptive story. This is where the big conflict happens and this is where the great promise starts. This is where the plan starts to take shape. Jesus is that promise. Jesus is the promise of redemption, and we're going to get there. But we have a lot of scripture to get through again. So from Genesis 3 all the way through Genesis 4, 5, and 6, in the beginning of 6, we see that the corruption on the earth is multiplying. Sin is going rampant, and violence is crazy, and God actually comes down, and he looks, and he says, I regret that I have made man. And so he plans to destroy his creation. And he does, and he sends a flood that destro destroys all creation. But before he does that, he calls Noah. You remember the story, Noah, right in Genesis 6 through Genesis 9? And he called him, and he saved him, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and a bunch of animals to come on this big boat with him. And they are saved from the destruction of the world. And even this story, even this story pointing us towards Jesus as God will come and judge the world one day, and Jesus will save those who are his. And so Jesus will be the last Noah. Well, Noah gets off the ark and humans start multiplying the earth and the Tower of Babel happens. You see that story. And then finally in Genesis 12, God calls Abram, who is renamed Abraham. And just to put this into historical context of what's, context of what's going on in the world, before Abraham is called by God, the pyramids in Egypt are already built. So there's civilization out there. There's a lot of people. And about 2,000 years after the fall, Abraham steps on the scene. And God says to Abraham in Genesis 12 that through him all the families of earth will be blessed. Through him all the families of earth shall be blessed. It's a promise of a savior. It's that promise he made so many years ago that one day someone will come and defeat sin. Abraham has a son, the son of promise, Isaac. Isaac grows up and Isaac has a son, Jacob. And Jacob grows up and he has 12 sons and his 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob is renamed Israel and his sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Moving through Genesis, we see that his second youngest son, Joseph, gets sold into slavery, into Egypt eventually, and by his brothers. But God is with Joseph, and Joseph raise, God raises Joseph up to be second in command over all of Egypt. 
And then through famine and some circumstance, God reunites Joseph with his family. There's reconciliation there, and all of Israel and all the people of Israel move into Egypt, settle in the land of Goshen, and live there for the rest of their lives. And this amazing, amazing thing happens in Genesis 48, if you want to turn there. Key point in scripture, Genesis 48, Jacob, who is Israel, is lying on his deathbed, and he's giving out blessings to his sons. His first three sons... Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, not my son Levi, his son Levi, <laughs> yeah, not my son Levi, um, forfeit the blessing because of sin in their life and things that they've done. So his fourth son, Judah, gets the blessing. And in Genesis 49, verse 8, it says this, Judah, your brothers shall praise you, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? Now look at verse 10. This is absolutely amazing. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. What's a scepter? Who holds a scepter? A king. A king holds a scepter. So what's Israel talking about here? What is Jacob talking about here? He doesn't have a kingdom. He doesn't own land. He lives in Egypt. Judah must have been looking at him like, what are you talking about? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. He's looking forward to this coming king that will come in the line of Judah. And then it even gets more amazing. It says, nor the ruler's staff from beneath his feet until, listen to this, loved ones, until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of all peoples. He's saying a king is going to come from the line of Judah and the obedience of all peoples will be under him. Kind of a weird thing to say while you're living in someone else's land, but he's pointing, he's foreshadowing, he's, he's prophesying about the coming Messiah who will be king of his people, who will um, uh, respect, get all the respect from all the people and his, uh, their obedience will be under him. Well, this brings us right to the end of, end of Genesis and what happens is, is, Jacob and all of his sons die, and they're in Egypt for quite a while, and a, and a new king takes over Egypt. And this brings us into Exodus chapter 1. A lot of hundreds of years just in the first chapter of Exodus 1, and a new king comes that doesn't know Joseph, doesn't know his people, and he sees this people of Israel who have multiplied greatly and are doing very, very well in his society, and he's scared of them. He's frightful of them, and he puts them into slavery and he makes them do hard labor. In fact, he tries to kill all of the male sons. He tries that twice, and on the second time, he succeeds. But one of them is escaped because his mother, and his name is Moses. And God raises up Moses to lead his people out of the land of Egypt. And if you read Exodus 1 through 15, you see the amazing works of God that he did to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. Moses, with the people of Israel, are promised the promised land, and they leave Egypt, and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. In this time, God gives Moses the law. And you guys remember the Ten Commandments? So that's written on, a, on stone tablets, and that's given to the people. But along with that, actually, there were 613 laws that are in uh, God's law for his people. And the point of this law, I mean wasn't really to make us righteous because none of us can live up to that. In Romans 7, we learn this, that the law was not to make us righteous. In fact, it showed us how sinful we were. The law shows us that we, we can't live up to God's expectations for our life. We cannot make ourselves righteous. We do not have it within us. And because we are sinners, God put forth a system of sacrifice. He put forth a system so that we would, um, they would, the Israelites would, um, get perfect lambs and, 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 and kill them for sacrifice of blood for their sins. But we learn in Isaiah 1.11, it says, I do not delight in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. Because God is seeking obedience. But all of this, the law, the sacrificial system, all of it pointing towards one day someone would come that would fulfill the law. There will be one person through the line of Judah that we now know that will fulfill the law perfectly. And all of those lambs and goats and bulls that were slaughtered for the sacrifice of our sin, they didn't forgive any sin. They just pointed to the perfect sacrifice that would come one day. 
And that person is Jesus Christ. This leads us to the end of Deuteronomy and Moses dies. You see the first five books of the Bible there? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy literally means the second telling of the law. And Deuteronomy is uh, laying out for the people from Moses what they are to do. And Moses dies and his right-hand man, Joshua, takes over the reins. And Joshua is to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. And if you read the book of Joshua, you see God conquering these people to give Israel the promised land. And Joshua leads them into that land. At this time, Joshua dies, that generation dies, and uh, up comes the ruling of the judges. So if you read the book of Judges, there's amazing stories in there. It's a period of 350 years. And, and uh, there's stories like Ehud, uh, Gideon, you remember that one? Or Samson, the really strong guy. Great stories, even to read to your kids. They would love those stories. You, and in that time period, also the book of Ruth is written. That's the time period for Ruth. So there's 350 years of the judges. And at the end of this time, the people of Israel come up to their prophet Samuel. And we move into 1 and 2 Samuel, the books of the Bible. And their histories of what's going on at this time. And they come to their prophet Samuel and they say to him, give us a king. Give us a king. We want to be like other nations. And this greatly distresses Samuel. And God is not pleased. And he says to the people, you don't want a king. God is your king. You don't want to be like other nations. You don't want to be under the rule of a man, be under the rule of your God, but they persist and God relents and gives them a king. And the first king of Israel, Saul, takes his throne. After 40 years, uh, Saul is replaced. He does what is evil in the sight of the Lord. He rejects God's commandments. He does things he's not supposed to do and God kills him in battle with his sons. And he replaces him with King David. David takes the reins, and David um, writes some amazing things. And the book of Psalms is written uh, by King David. And if you do a lot of your devotions, maybe in the Psalms, that's most likely written by David. Most of it is. And uh, he prophesies in his writing about this coming king, not himself, but this coming king um, that would save his people. I'm going to go through a couple of them with you. In Psalm 2, he says that he will be begotten by God and we should take refuge in him. In Psalm 23, he says, he is the shepherd who restores the soul and leads his people in paths of righteousness. In Psalm 51, he washes us clean with his blood that we may be whiter than snow. In 91, it says, the angels obey him and would come to his aid, but instead he bears the cup of God's wrath. In 110, he is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In 119, he is the word of God incarnate and the only lamp for our path. This is written 1,000 years before the time of Christ. So the time from Adam to Abraham was about 2,000 years. The time from Abraham to David was another 1,000 years. And in this time, God is making promises. God is foreshadowing. God is revealing himself that one day someone will come that will give them relief from sin. David has a son, Solomon. Solomon writes a lot too. He wrote the book of mostly of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. Um, and then his son, after reigning for 40 years, takes over and his name is Rehoboam. And Rehoboam wasn't as wise as his father and grandfather and he made some foolish mistakes not listening to wise counsel and then in the year 931 BC, the kingdom of Israel splits. And we're left with the northern kingdom, which can, um, is the t 10 northern tribes, and the southern kingdom, which is the two most southern tribes. The northern kingdom has 19 kings that follow, and all of them do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And in 722 BC, God wipes them off the face of the planet, and the Assyrians come in and destroy them. And they're never to be heard from again. In the time of the northern kingdom, God had his prophets there, and they were Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. So at the back of the Old Testament, you have the major prophets and the minor prophets. These were the prophets that were in the time of the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom had 20 kings. 12 of them were evil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Eight of them were good or kind of good. And during this time, the prophets in the southern kingdom were Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. And during this time, which is 700 years before the time of Christ, Isaiah writes this. 
in chapter 7. He will be born of a virgin. In chapter 9, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the government will be on his shoulders. In chapter 11, a shoot coming from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father, so the line of Judah, he's saying that this person will come from David's line. In chapter 40, in his coming, the glory of the Lord is revealed and all flesh shall see it together. In 42, he is the Lord's servant in whom his soul delights and with who he is very well pleased. In chapter 43, we say he is Israel's only savior and there is no other. In 53, he was despised and rejected by men. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. He bore our grief and carried our sorrows. Wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, he brought us peace, and by his stripes we are healed. He is anointed by the Lord to preach good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, proclaiming the day of vengeance of our God and comforts all those who mourn. And in 65 it says he created a new heavens and new earth and will dwell with his people forever. Isaiah is looking forward to this coming king, to this promised Messiah 700 years before the time of Christ. And even though the southern kingdom had some good kings, they had a lot of evil kings, and they killed the prophets that God had sent to them, they disobeyed the word of the Lord, and in 586 B.C., they are taken into captivity under the Babylonians, and their kingdom is destroyed. During this time, Daniel, Ezekiel, Esther, Jeremiah are written, and all of them are pointing to the promised Messiah. Daniel says in chapter 7 that the Son of Man, whom the Ancient of Days gives all dominion and all people, nations and languages, they should serve him. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, he prophesies that there will be a new covenant, and God says, I will write my law on their heart And the sign of this will be the forgiveness of sins. All pointing to the coming Messiah, this perfect eternal covenant that will be made. All the other covenants that God made with his people, they had broke, but this covenant will be an eternal covenant fully relying on the grace of God. After 70 years of being in captivity, the people of Israel are allowed to return to their land and rebuild their temple. And at this time, First and Second Chronicles are written most likely by Ezra, who also re- writes the book of Ezra, and most likely Nehemiah. And Ezra and Nehemiah lead their people into their land, rebuild the temple, and Zechariah, Haggai, Joel, and Malachi are written at this time. Malachi prophesies that Elijah will come back. He's talking about John the Baptist. And then there's 400 years of silence. We've seen the fall of man. Sin has entered the world. God made a promise. He saved Noah. He called Abraham. Through his descendants came Judah, and out of him came a king, and the king prophesies that one day there will be another king who will eternally reign. They disobey God, and even though their kingdom was destroyed, God preserved them through captivity and brought them back to their land. They prophesy one day he's coming, and then there's 400 years of silence. Any movie you've ever watched, any novel you've ever read, I'm sure it had some suspense in it. And God, over thousands of years, has built the suspense. He's foretold his coming He's promised and promised, and everyone is waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. All right, let's take a deep breath. We just covered 4,000 years of history, all right? But all of it's pointing to this one thing. All of it's pointing to this one person. Just think about this, think about this. Millions of people have come and gone. Empires have literally been built and have fallen. People for thousands of years have been seeking a relief from their own shame with no avail. People have been worshiping false gods and making sacrifices to them, trying to find a way to rekindle the relationship with the divine, but they did not know God. Through all of these thousands of years, God has made a promise, and then the creator, Jesus, who created all things and set the scene and was the promise, steps onto the stage. And we come to the climax of this great story. Jesus, the fulfillment. Jesus, 
the fulfillment, the creator, the promised one becomes part of his own creation to save it. Even though they hated him, even though they never obeyed his laws, he came out of love anyway. And we know this, that Christ came at exactly the right time. He didn't come a year early or a year late. It says in Romans 5, 6 that while we were still sinners at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ was working all of human history together to this one climactic point that Jesus would come and Jesus would fulfill the promise and Jesus would be the sacrifice. We move into the New Testament of the Bible And the first four books of the Bible are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in these testaments of Jesus' life, we see his ministry, his, his birth, his ministry, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Jesus begins his ministry at around age 30, and he calls 12 people to be his disciples, 12 men to be his disciples. He teaches them for about three years, and he does extraordinary things. Please read through Luke. Please read through Matthew and see the amazing things that Jesus has done. He heals the sick. He raises the dead back back to life. He teaches with authority from Scripture like no one ever has before. He fulfills all the prophecy. He commands and controls nature itself. He says to the sea, calm, and the sea calms. He performs miracles in front of thousands of people, and he's casting out demons. And even though he does extraordinary things, his statements about himself are even more extraordinary. He claims amazing things. He claims that he is the great I am, that he and the Father are one, that he is the creator, that he and he alone is the only way to the Father, that he and he alone can forgive sins, and he and he alone can grant eternal life. A lot of people followed him. People were amazed, as they should be. He is God. But there were some people that didn't like him very much. And the religious leaders of the day in Judea despised him. You see, they were committing the same sin that Adam and Eve committed 4,000 years earlier, that they wanted to be like God that they wanted the praise of people, that they thought that they knew best. And when the Savior of the world, when that creator came and was standing before them, they hated him. They hated him because he was God and they were not. And they sought to kill him. And one of Jesus' disciples, Judas, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. And every time I read that text, I think to myself, oh Lord, let there never be a price that I would give up my Savior for. For 30 pieces of silver, he betrays his only hope of salvation. He brings the guards to him. Jesus is arrested. Jesus is brought before the council. He is beaten. He is spit upon. He is slapped. He is accused of things that are untrue. He won't answer them. He's taken before the governor of Judea, his name is Pilate of the Roman Empire. Pilate can find no guilt in him. He says to them, I cannot find no guilt in this man. And they say, crucify him, crucify him. Kill him. Pilate bends to the will of the Jews and he hands Jesus over to be crucified. Jesus is beat, he's whipped, He's scourged almost to death. And then they put a cross on his back and they have him carry it. He goes up to Golgotha, which is the hill just outside of Jerusalem. And there they nail him to a cross and he hangs on a cross from the wood of a tree that he created. He hangs on the cross and he asks the Father to forgive those who are doing this to him. He hangs on the cross, and the people who brought him there are the people who he came to save. He's been rejected by men. They rip off his clothes. They throw lots for them, just as prophesied in Scripture. And he's hanging on the cross, and he says these amazing words just before he dies. He says, it is finished. 
This is the climax of our story. This is the climax of all human history. The promise from Genesis 3 all the way through Israel's history. Thousands of years of people. Thousands of years of false religion. Thousands of years of sacrifice leading to this one moment. And Jesus says, it is finished. The payment has been made. No longer, no longer do you need to worry about your sin. It is paid for. No longer do you need to worry about how you can be reconciled to God. Jesus reconciles you to God. The plan of redemption is in full swing, and it's working perfectly. He dies on the cross, and the disciples think that they're at great loss. But the reality is, is it was a great victory. And on Friday, he dies, but on Sunday, he's raised from the dead. And I heard a wise man say that if Friday was the payment On Sunday, we got the receipt. And Jesus is raised from the dead, proving that he has power over Satan, sin, and death. He's the power of God to be raised from the dead. He appears to Mary first and then the disciples, and he walks with them for 40 days on earth. He has lunch with them. Hundreds of people, the New Testament tells us, see him. And after these 40 days, he takes his disciples and he says to them, All authority has been given to me, and he ascends to heaven. So now what? Our climax is completed. All of human history, all of the Bible pointing to this one moment. So now what? Well, before Jesus ascends, he puts his disciples on mission. And he says to them, all authority has been given to me, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he gives this promise that I will be with you always until the end of the age. And he ascends to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning in all authority and power with all glory. And now we move to our falling action of this ongoing story, Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission The book of Acts comes next, and in the book of Acts, we see the early church. We see that the apostles all gathered, and the Holy Spirit flooded where they were, and Peter starts to preach, and thousands come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in one afternoon. Thousands more are added, and the church begins to explode. The gospel is contagious. This anticipation of the Savior is finally realized, and Jesus is here. He's done the work, and you can be saved. We see the conversion of Paul and his missionary journeys, and uh, plants many churches, and then we see from Romans all the way to Jude that these epistles are written. And these letters are written, and these are all letters to the various churches and individuals at that time. Paul writes the majority of those, but Peter, Jude, John, and James write as well. And then something really interesting happens. God's great plan, his redemptive story, intersects with our present day reality. We are a part of this story. We are are on mission for Jesus Christ. And the New Testament lays out so many principles and godly living and things to do because God has saved us. But the greatest application, really, for our Christian life is this. Are you fulfilling the mission that God has put you on? Are you fulfilling the great commission that Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples? Are you going out and making disciples? How can you say you are fulfilling your calling This is your calling. It's amazing. So many of us struggle with sin, and the first question should be, well, am I doing what God has called me to do? Maybe if I was out doing what God had called me to do, I wouldn't be so distracted by the sin in this world. Are you fulfilling God's message? And this is really our greatest application right now for the church. Are we fulfilling the mission that God has put us on? How can we sit idly by as God has planned out this massive story for us. We have the opportunity to be a player in God's story. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, we're not there yet, and we kind of bump into real time, and we haven't hit the conclusion of this story yet, but the Bible, and God in his kindness, is so sweet to us to lay out what's going to happen. 
And in the book of Revelation and even through part of the Gospels and the epistles, we see what is going to happen. And this brings us to our conclusion. The conclusion of the story is Jesus' return. He's coming back. And I bet there's plenty of good Bible scholars here in the room and you've studied Revelation and you've tried to figure out all the meanings and what it says and you've listened to hundreds of tapes and sermons about what's going on in Revelation and maybe your post-trib, mid-trib, pre-trib, trib, 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 I don't even know all of the language and you've talked about this until the cows have come home but this is the one thing that we can all definitely agree upon. Jesus is coming back. There should be no argument in the church about this one. Jesus is coming back. The entire book of Revelation is about who Jesus Christ is, his character, and that he is coming back. If you've read too far into it, you've missed the point. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back to judge the world. We learn that in the end of days, in the conclusion of this story, Jesus will come back, and he will take that ancient serpent that we learned in Revelation 12, verse 9, that he is Satan, he is the devil. He will take him, and he will throw him into the lake of fire and an everlasting hell. We learn that he's coming back, and he will gather all his people to himself. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, he will accept you into his kingdom. And Jesus even says that he has prepared a place for you. He's also coming back to judge the whole world. And those who have rejected Jesus Christ, those who have said no to his grace, those who have despised him, those who wanted to be like God themselves, will be thrown into the lake of fire and hell with the serpent. Right now, we have a choice to make. What side of history will we be on? Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've trusted in the promises of this world, and they've all failed you, and you don't know what's coming after this life. Let me tell you, the the glory is not out of reach. All you need do is believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you will be saved. There's nothing else you can do. You can't become righteous on your own. You can't save yourself. One day you will stand before God and if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you'll say, I don't deserve to come in, but because of Jesus, because of his work, I am made righteous. Or you will stand before God and you'll say, I lived a pretty good life. I think I should come in. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. In grade two, I remember my favorite book was one of these choose your own adventure books. You remember these? And uh, I remember this one very specifically. It was about a deer and you were the deer in the story. And so on the first page, it would have a picture of the deer, and you had to make a choice. And so it was, um, do you want to go down this path or this path? If it's this path, turn to page 6. If you choose this path, turn to page 16. And so you'd make your decision, and then you would turn to that page, and you would see in the first path, and maybe on page 6, there was green grass and bunnies and everything wonderful in life, food to eat. And if you went down the other path, there was like a hunter there waiting, and he shot you, and you had to start again. Well, we all have a choice to make. We all have a decision to make. Will you choose the path and turn to the page that leads to eternal life, trusting fully in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or will you turn to the page that leads to eternal damnation? That is the choice that you have to make. Listen, 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 this is so important. Right now, we are not at the conclusion. Right now, we are in the falling action of this story. We are in a period of grace. There is still time. There is still time to turn from your sin and repent and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation and in him alone. The glory is not out of reach. Jesus saved me. If only you knew my life. Trust me, I'm not perfect. I'm desperately needing my Savior every, every, every single day. Nobody in this room that is a Christian is perfect. They'll be the first to tell you. But they're forgiven by Jesus Christ, the only one who can forgive. Mankind has a massive issue on their hands. And the only solution is Jesus Christ. All of history points to it. The whole scripture points to it. Will you accept him? If you want to accept Jesus, you can right now. 
if the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart right now and you, and you have this wall of pride, drop it. Drop the pride, drop the self-reliance, drop this pursuit of self-righteousness, lay it down and accept Jesus Christ for the fulfillment of the promise and for the forgiveness of your sin. Allow him to be your savior. Allow him to change your life. And we're gonna pray now, and at the end of my prayer, I'm gonna include a prayer for you. If you want to accept Jesus Christ, you follow that prayer, but you repent of your sin, and you believe in Jesus Christ as your only savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, O God, that even though we didn't deserve it, even though we sinned against you, even though every human who has ever existed on the face of this earth has sinned against you and rejected you, O God, you chose to set forth a plan that we might be saved. Lord, in your love, you saved Noah. In your love, you called Abraham. In your love, you preserved Israel. In your love, you prophesied, you foreshadowed, O oh God. You, you showed us that he was coming. And when he came, he did not disappoint. Jesus came to this earth and he died as the perfect sacrifice, reconciling us to the Father, forgiving us our sins, O oh God, so that now we can have reunion and communion with our Father in heaven. And so, Lord, I pray for those who, for the first time, want to accept Jesus Christ. And maybe they would say this, God, I'm a sinner. I realize the shame in my heart. I can see it. And Lord, I need relief. Lord, I recognize that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He is the only one who can reconcile me to the Father, and he is the only one who can forgive me of my sins. Lord, would you write your law on my heart? Oh God, would your Holy Spirit fill me and change me? Lord, I repent of my sins, and I trust in Jesus Jesus and Jesus alone for my salvation. Lord, we all need you, oh God. And so, Lord, would you fill us again? Oh, Lord, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may be on mission for your gospel. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen.